Hello, everyone, and welcome to CSM 2020 Virtual Edition. Um, before I get started, I'd just like to take a few seconds to um, acknowledge um, my nominator for this award, and that is uh, Jerry Wright, uh, who's the director of the Michael DeGroote Institute for Infectious Disease Research here at McMaster University. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Mario Feldman, who supported my nomination as well. Uh, Mario is um, uh, used to be at the University of Alberta and has since relocated to um, Washington University of St. Louis and has been a great um, supporter of my young career. Okay, so because this is an award lecture, I thought I'd take a minute or two just to introduce you a little bit um, to my background. Um, so back in 2003, I drove from Kingston, Ontario to the University of Guelph, uh, where I did a four-year bachelor's degree in a program called Biological Chemistry, uh, which I'm not sure exists anymore, uh, but I really enjoyed it because it was sort of a sort of a degree in organic chemistry with lots of room to take biochemistry electives. Um, and so um, after four uh, really fun years in Guelph, I then moved to the University of Toronto, uh, where I did my PhD with uh, Lynn Howell, uh, who's at the University of Toronto and is also affiliated with the Hospital for Sick Children. And so here at Sick Kids, I learned um, uh, um, a lot of structural biology, and I applied this technique to, um, to sort of learn about the functions of proteins involved in microbial biofilm formation. Uh, so I graduated uh, from my PhD at the end of 2012, start of 2013, uh, and then I um, flew out west uh, to start a postdoc at the University of Washington, which is located in Seattle. And so here I was in the Department of Microbiology uh, in the lab of Dr. Joseph Mujo, and it was here where I really became enamored with um, bacteriology. And this is sort of what continues to drive, um, uh, what, what motivates me and continues to drive my research interest today. And so from 2013 to 2016, uh, I was in Joseph's lab. Uh, and then I joined the faculty at McMaster um, in January of 2017 um, to start my own independent research group. Okay. Um, so generally speaking, my lab is interested in the mechanisms that uh, different species of bacteria interact with one another. And so macroscopically, you might think of it as um, something like this, where um, you can have a collection of bacteria getting along. Um, this is a microbial biofilm shown here on the left. Um, and you can also look at this more microscopically and you can see that, you know, in these, um, these communities, you know, bacteria are in very close physical association with one another. And in sometimes, you know, bacteria will work together um, to achieve a common goal. Uh, other times, um, different species of bacteria don't like to coexist with one another. And consequently, they've evolved uh, specific mechanisms to antagonize one another. Now, the field of microbial interactions is, is a quite exciting one to be a part of, and it's actually um, relatively new. Um, and when you think about it, um, you know, we've sort of understood the, the nature of um, both, you know, cooperative and antagonistic interactions between mammals for hundreds of years. And so I think, you, you know, all of us growing up sort of gain an appreciation for predator-prey relationships um, and sort of, um, you know, when it comes to to large mammals, you know, who's the top of the food chain. Um, but interestingly, um, you know, research in this avenue uh, in the context of bacteria uh, has significantly lagged behind. And so one of the reasons I think this is the case is that, you know, the, the, the history of microbiology um, really originated from um, sort of a, a human-centered and disease-centered point of view. And this was born out of necessity because obviously once upon a time, um, pathogenic microbes um, uh, posed a huge threat to the human population. And so one of the first uh, clinician scientists um, is of course Robert Koch. And he is famous for both the idea that for bacteria to be studied in a reductionist manner, you need to come up with a way to purify individual species. And he also established reductionist principles for determining the causative agents of infectious disease. And so this, Dr. Koch's work, of course, led to uh, the famous Koch's postulates, um, which I won't get into in detail. But the point of me bringing this up is that this sort of view of single agent, single disease um, uh, microbiology um, sort of overlooked microbe microbe interactions. And I think that's why this sort of field has only begun to take off in recent years. Okay, so as I think many 
individuals in this audience know, bacteria very, very often exist in complex communities. They're not, most species are not found in sites where their only neighbors are um, sort of clonal uh, versions of themselves. And so, you know, just to go over this in sort of a very surface level way, um, you know, one environment where this is very well studied is the rhizosphere. Uh, so the region of soil that is in close proximity to um, plant roots. And here you have very defined um, communities of bacteria that confer benefits to their associated plant. Um, and the plant, of course, provides nutrients for the bacteria. Um, as we all know, um, the human gut microbiome has received a lot of attention in recent years. Um, and there's incredibly dense bacterial populations here that are beneficial for human health. They also aid in the, um, in the prevention of, of infectious disease. Um, and third, but um, also quite important, I think, is in the, in, is in the food science sector. And so uh, obviously fermented foods rely on microorganisms um, in their, for their production. Um, and again, in these types of um, environments, you, you find um, complex communities of microbes. And so obviously there's a lot of different ways that these microbes are interacting with one another. Um, and so the, the focus I'm gonna um, talk to you guys about today is, um, is competitive interactions. And it's been shown that these competitive interactions are, are, are quite important for influencing the composition of microbial communities. And I put a bunch of references there um, for anyone who's interested, um, you can um, screen capture this. Um, but it's really just to illustrate that the, the, the idea that microbes are actively competing with one another is quite recent, um, but also um, you know, quite exciting because we're learning all these different mechanisms that microbes use to interact with one another. Okay, so as I sort of alluded to at the start, um, there's you know, several different ways that bacteria interact with one another. Um, I'm, I'm, this is not meant to be all encompassing, um, but one way that, you know, one way to sort of partition the way that the inter microbes interact is by those interactions that are cooperative in nature. And so an example of that is a biofilm where you have different species of bacteria contributing to the overall architecture and stability of the community. Um, and within these communities, you can have interactions uh, involving the uh, shared use of metabolites. You know, individual bacteria um, can be good at um, metabolizing certain metabolites, um, but they can also help produce enzymes, for example, that aid in the digestion of other metabolites for which other bacteria can benefit. And so these are examples of, of cooperative interactions. And then the other side of the equation, you have antagonistic interactions. And so these have been um, in some ways known for a long time, right? So with um, sort of Alexander Fleming's famous picture where the, um, the penicillium mold sort of falls onto the um, Petri dish and this causes a zone of clearing for Staph aureus. And so this type of interaction is mediated by small molecules. Um, and uh, could be categorized as sort of diffusible antibacterials, uh, which are used for microbial competition. Um, however, these types of um, toxins um, aren't always efficacious in environments um, where dilution effects uh, are quite um, uh, significant. And so what bacteria have also evolved are forms of interbacterial competition um, that are dependent on cell-to-cell -cell contact. And so here you have much more localized bacteria-bacteria um, um, interactions. And this is gonna be the focus of my talk today. Um, so in my lab, there's two major pathways we focus on that are involved in um, interbacterial competition. And so one of these pathways, uh, which is not the focus of my talk today, is called the bacterial type seven secretion system. Um, so this secretion system is actually widespread in gram-positive bacteria. Uh, there's two flavors of type seven secretion system. So there's the type seven secretion system A, which is probably the one that many of you have heard of. Um, and so an example of this is the ESX1 secretion system in Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is one of the principal vir virulence determinants of this organism. Now, um, I would say a much more abundant ver flavor of type seven secretion systems are the type seven secretion systems B, which are found in Firmicutes bacteria. Um, and the majority of type seven secretion system Bs, or at least current evidence suggests that these systems evolved to target competitor bacteria. And so uh, this all came about in uh, 2016 and 2017. And so again, this is a field that's just really taking off and um, it's really exciting to be a part of. And we don't really know a lot how this secretion system works. Um, so we've sort of schematized it here. 
Um, but the idea is that the um, interbacterial competition is mediated by what we call effector proteins that are translocated from the cytoplasm of an attacking bacterium and through mechanisms to, uh, for which we don't understand at all, um, these effectors are able to intoxicate a susceptible target bacterium. Okay, so here I'm depicting uh, two competing gram-positive cells and the membrane on the top represents the susceptible target bacterium. Now initial work in characterizing the antibacterial pathway, uh, sorry, activity of this pathway was done by myself in Streptococcus and the lab of Tracy Palmer in Staphylococcus. And really excitingly, uh, over the course of this um, COVID shutdown, uh, several preprints were posted on BioArchive showing that um, now we, also showing that Bacillus subtilis and Enterococcus faecalis uh, also use this pathway to target other bacteria. And so it's looking like this is going to be a quite um, prevalent and widespread uh, phenotype in gram-positive bacteria. So it's really exciting to be on the ground floor of this field. Um, the other major pathway we study in my lab is called the bacterial type 6 secretion system. And this is what I'm going to be talking to you about today. And so um, it's somewhat analogously to the type 7, um, the type 6 secretion system is, as I put up the title here, a bacteria killing nanomachine. Um, in contrast to the type 7 secretion system, we know a lot more about how this machine functions. And so this um, apparatus is found in, exclusively in gram-negative bacteria and spans both the inner and outer membrane of these organisms. Um, uh, it's, it's one of the most, it's, it's the most abundant um, specialized secretion system in bacteria, and it's widespread in both proteobacteria and bacter bacteroidetes. Um, structurally, uh, it's quite interesting because the apparatus itself resembles the tail component of contractile bacteria phage. And so you can sort of think of type 6 killing events as resembling inverted phage that lack capsids that fire uh, effector proteins into target bacteria. And so I've depicted that here, and so you can see the phage uh, base plate and uh, tube and spike-like components of the type 6 secretion system at the bottom of the slide here. And again, in, uh, functionally analogously to the type 7 secretion system, the toxicity of the system is caused by um, the biochemistry of effector proteins that are delivered into susceptible target cells by uh, the contract contraction-like um, motion of the type 6 apparatus, which is depicted on the right here. Okay, so the story I want to tell you guys today is uh, published work. Um, you know, this is sort of the time of year where I think we all are looking forward to going to Gordon conferences and presenting unpublished data. Um, but the last three or four months have certainly been um, a little different than usual and have sort of torpedoed this, this, uh, this usual plan. And so, um, so I apologize, some of you may have seen this work before. Um, but we're quite excited uh, about these findings and we think it's gonna lead to a lot of interesting follow-up. Okay, so um, the story I'm gonna tell you today is about a, an effector that we discovered in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is an opportunistic pathogen that I'm sure many of you have heard of. Um, and many of the effectors that transit the type 6 secretion system are encoded in a genomic um, architecture that looks something like this three gene operon shown at the top here. And, and so in work I don't have time to talk to you about today, the first gene in these three gene um, operons usually encodes a chaperone protein. And in published and ongoing work, um, you know, we've been able to show that these chaperones are actually involved in loading the toxins into the type six secretion system nanomachine. Uh, the toxins themselves are encoded by the effector gene shown in blue there. Um, and you can see that in this sort of case study here, our sort of model effector is depicted as a two domain protein. And so the N-terminal domain is called a PAR domain, which has this cone-like shape, and chaperones are typically involved in loading this PAR domain onto the VGRG spike protein shown in green. Um, and then at the other end of the protein, you have what's known as the toxin domain. And this is actually responsible for the killing of the target bacteria. And so, um, I'm going to tell you a story today about um, a, a previously unknown tox domain that we were able to characterize using genetics, biochemistry, and microbiology. And just one last point of, um, of, of importance, um, because these toxins are antibacterial in nature, 
um, toxin producing bacteria need to produce immunity factors such that when they, um, when these toxins come out of the ribosome, they can be neutralized and not kill the toxin producing, producing organisms. These immunity proteins are stripped away from their corresponding toxin um, during type six secretion, but the mechanism for this is um, completely unknown. Okay, so the majority of the work for um, the story I'm gonna tell you about today uh, was conducted by a graduate student in my lab, Sherry Ahmad, and a postdoctoral fellow, Bo Yuan Wang, uh, who works in Michael Laub's lab at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And this was a really fun collaboration that um, originated at a Gordon conference um, in 2018 uh, called the Microbial Stress Response Meeting. Um, and it's, it's one of those, um, it's so one of those collaborations that just worked really, really well. And um, I think we were all in the same, same wavelength in terms of what experiments needed to be done to see either through to completion. Okay, so full credit to Sherry and Bo Yuan. <clears throat> okay, so this, um, this project started from an observation. And so um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is really a model organism for the understanding of type six secretion system structure and function. And the reason it's a model organism is it's one of the original bacteria for which this pathway was discovered. And importantly, we have a really good handle on the effectors secreted um, by, by the type six in this organism. And so um, my graduate student, Sherry, made a pretty interesting observation early on in this PhD when he was comparing the six effectors uh, produced by Pseudomonas originosa across um, hundreds of, of clinical isolates. And what he noticed is that of the six effectors, and I've put their activities um, in text there uh, with, with PFT standing for poor forming toxin, and the others are, um, oh, and, and ART stands for ADP or basal transferase. Um, you know, they have varying activities, but what he noticed was that when he compared across strains, and notably in the other well characterized um, Pseudomonas originosa strain PA14, is that Five of these effectors are essentially invariant among all Pseudomonas aeruginosa isolates, but the sixth effector exhibits a lot of sequence divergence. And uh, he further noticed that the corresponding immunity proteins for each of these effectors followed the same trend. And so given what we know about effector immunity proteins, it suggest, suggested to us that perhaps the sixth effector, TC6, was um, specifically involved in strain level competition between Pseudomonas originosa, whereas perhaps the other five effectors were involved in interspecies competition um, between, between Pseudomonas originosa and um, other non Pseudomonas originosa species. So the hypothesis, of course, is that if TSC6 is highly variable, then strains with different alleles of this gene may be incompatible due to killing that's elicited by TSC6. And so the prediction would be that PA14 and PA01 would be incompatible. However, PA01 and PA01 could coexist, of course, because they have the exact same immunity and PA14 and PA14 could coexist. Okay, so let's look take a little bit of a closer look at this um, to sort of substantiate um, this hypothesis with a little bit more uh, granular detail. And so um, the gene encoding this TSC6 effector is actually found right next to the type 6 secretion system apparatus genes. And if you take a closer look, you'll remember I talked about some effectors are actually uh, two domain proteins. And what was really neat is that the five prime end of TSC6, which, for which the encoded protein uh, is responsible for interacting with chaperones, is actually 100% conserved at the nucleotide level across all Pseudomonas originosa strains. However, at the three prime end of the gene, which encodes the toxin, there was no homology whatsoever. So that 54% I showed you earlier was, was, a, was an average across the gene, but really it's very, um, it's, it's very uh, region, it's very uh, uh, localized to specific areas of the gene. Furthermore, the, what we predicted to be um, the immunity determinant in PA14 had no homology with the characterized immunity determinant TSI6 uh, in PA01. Okay, and so Sherry was really intrigued by this, and it was also really interesting that um, we were unable to predict what this potentially new toxin might do in PA14. Um, one possibility, of course, is that it still functions the same as TSC6, it functions as an NADase, um, um, but the highly divergent homology suggested it might have unique toxin function. And so this is, um, uh, 
this is another interesting observation that was um, carried out by my colleague, Dr. Andrew MacArthur and his student, Rachel Tran. And we wanted to sort of map across the Pseudomonas aeruginosa phylogeny, you know, which strains had TSE6 and which had this novel toxin. And it was really neat because it seemed like strains that were closely related to PA01, shown in the blue bubble, uh, by and large seemed to possess TSE6, whereas strains closely related to PA14 seemed to possess this novel toxin. So it could be that these, this locus played a big role in the sort of the divergence of PA1 from, from PA14 uh, during the um, 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 divergence of these, of these strains. Okay, so Sherry started it out by testing this hypothesis by making a knockout of this, of this new gene, uh, PA14-01140, and he, and he carried out a competition experiment, which is basically um, you, you mix a donor and recipient strain under type six conducive conditions, um, which is um, generally requires prolonged cell to cell to cell contact. So we do this on, on solid media. And he found that a PA14 strain lacking 1140 had a significant fitness defect against PA14 relative to the control strain. Interestingly, the prediction would also be that PA14 is susceptible to the activity of TSC6 because again, both strains have unique predicted toxin immunity. And he also found this to be the case. So he found that a PA01 strain lacking TSC6 was less fit against PA14 than it's compared to a strain that did have TSC6. So this is quite promising. We next wanted to examine the hypothesis that this, this um, new toxin 1140 also had a unique immu immunity determinant downstream of it. And so to do this, we carried out experiments um, uh, known as intraspecific competitions because we wanted to probe the function of a single gene. So here we're looking at PA14 attackers versus PA14 prey cells, okay? And so in red, obviously when you have the same genotype of attackers and prey, you have uh, no significant change in, in co-culture fitness from the start of the experiment to the end of the experiment. However, in the, in the prey bacterium, when you knock out this new um, predicted effector immunity um, locus, it all of a sudden becomes susceptible to the activity of the toxin uh, from the donor cell. Now this can be complemented by providing um, what we uh, hypothesize to be immunity uh, by expressing PA14-01130 on a plasmid. And this rescued the co-culture fitness defect. Um, shown here are a couple controls. So here this shows that the, the, that the phenotype we were observing is dependent on the effector in the attacking strain. And this control shows that the phenotype is dependent on a functional type six secretion system. And so collectively, these data basically tell us that we indeed have a new effector immunity pair, and that it is not cross-neutralized by TSI6 um, in, in PA01. Okay, so Sherry really wanted to figure out what this new protein did. And so as a first step, we were able to solve the structure of 1140 in complex with its immunity protein 1130, uh, shown here. Um, and what was quite remarkable is that when Sherry took this structure and compared it against all the known structures in the protein data bank, he found a number of interesting hits that immediately emerged at the top. Um, and these hits all belong to an uh, enzyme family called uh, the REL-A SPO-T homolog or RSH family of enzymes. Now, why is this interesting? Um, well, what do REL-A and SPO-T proteins do? Uh, before I get into that, um, <clears throat> The, the, uh, even though there was very, very little primary sequence homology between our toxin and these REL proteins, it is important to note that the residues that are required for catalysis by this family of enzymes were completely conserved between our toxin and um, characterized REL proteins as shown here on the bottom right. Okay, so what do REL proteins do? Um, so I think we've all learned um, prokaryotic translation at some point um, in our training, so I won't go over this in great detail, but just to remind everyone that um, you have amino acylated tRNAs coming into the ribosome. Um, and this of course leads to a nascent, the, the formation of a nascent polypeptide chain. And then upon you know, encountering a stop codon, the ribosome dissociates and you have your folded protein. Um, but what happens when bacteria are starved of amino acids? Um, well, one, one thing that happens is that you get an accumulation of uncharged tRNAs, uh, which is obviously not good for translation. Um, and so what ends up happening is you get, um, there's a protein called REL-A that's able to basically sense uncharged tRNAs by forming a physical complex um, uh, with, these, um, 
with these uncharged tRNAs. And together, the RelA tRNA complex interacts with the ribosome. And what this interaction does is it um, induces a conformational change that puts RelA into a catalytically competent um, conformation. And in this state, RelA is able to use ATP and either GDP or GDP to make a one of two molecules called PPGPP or PPPGPP, with the other byproduct being AMP. Why is this important? Well, PPGPP is a very well studied signaling molecule in bacteria. It's been studied for over 50 years, and it has a number of effects on the cells. On cells, um, probably the best characterized of these effects is its ability to interact with RNA polymerase and alter global gene expression. And in doing so, it lowers the abundance of stable RNAs in bacteria, uh, which would make sense, right? Because if you want to slow down, if you're starving of amino acids, you want to slow down translation. And one way to do so would be to lower the abundance, cellular abundance of ribosomal RNAs. Also has an effect on DNA replication and GTP biosynthesis. Uh, ultimately, what this does is put bacteria in a state of dormancy uh, such that they can conserve energy until the nutrient conditions around them um, change to an environment that is more favorable. And so the question is, um, well, the implication here is, um, you know, what the heck is our toxin doing? Um, given that rel proteins aren't secreted by secretion systems, um, rather they're sort of life-saving in a way and that they, that they promote survival. And so the first hypothesis that we had is, wow, maybe this, we've identified the first secreted PPGPP uh, enzyme, uh, synthesizing enzyme, and perhaps it's, it's um, you know, it's effectively inducing dormancy in competitor bacteria, even in conditions where dormancy is not beneficial for survival, because that would, I think it's logical that that would confer a growth advantage on attacking cells. Um, but before we could make any sort of conclusion that, uh, like this, uh, we needed to do some biochemistry. Um, and so uh, this is where um, our collaboration with Mike really took off. Um, Bo Yuan is a, a, an expert um, uh, biochemist when it comes to um, PPGPP synthesizing enzymes. And so um, Sherry went down to Mike's lab and him and Bo Yuan, Bo Yuan worked together in uh, figuring out how this enzyme worked. And so just to recap, this is a reaction um, characterized by um, uh, true PPGPP synthetases, okay? So if you recall, I said you have a GTP um, acceptor nucleotide, okay? And it basically uh, accepts pyrophosphate from ATP, okay? And that'll give you the PPGPP molecule shown here on the right, plus an AMP byproduct, okay? So it's a pyrophosphorylation of the three prime hydroxyl of GDP, okay? So the first experiment that Bo Yuan did was a coupled enzyme assay in which the control red line here is basically um, just a negative control where one of the enzymes in the coupled assay was left out. And then he took our toxin that Sherry had purified and incubated with ATP and GTP. And of course the prediction would be that if it had this activity, ATP levels would rapidly drop. And this is indeed what Bo Yuan saw. But what we thought was gonna be a control experiment actually ended up being the sort of um, uh, breakthrough experiment that really told us what this enzyme did was when Bo Yuan carried out a reaction that lacked what we thought was an, would be the necessary guanine nucleotide acceptor, GTP. And interestingly, when this was left out, Bo Yuan saw a, an, equal, uh, an equally fast drop in ATP levels um, in the reaction. And so given that this is a you know, relatively straightforward and, you know, assay, um, the most parsimonious explanation for this observation was that in contrast to characterized rel enzymes, perhaps um, R1140 toxin is somehow able to use um, adenine nucleotides as pyrophosphate acceptors. So it's not catalyzing the rel reaction because that reaction requires guanine nucleotides. Perhaps it's doing something like this, right? Um, now we were a little skeptical because nucleotides such as the one depicted on the right there had not really been observed in any sort of biological setting, um, but this is the way our data was pointing to us. And so we had to move to a higher resolution assay where we were no longer looking at the disappearance of substrates, but actually the formation of products. Um, and to do this, we did an FPLC based assay. And so we carried out three parallel reactions to see what might be happening here. We basically incubated AMP plus ATP. 
to look at the possibility that AMP could act as an acceptor, pyrophosphate acceptor. We looked at ADP plus ATP, and we looked at ATP alone. And surprisingly and excitingly, in all three cases, the adenosine nucleotides in the reaction were able to serve as pyrophosphate acceptors, um, uh, basically telling us that we basically discovered the first PPAPP synthetase enzyme um, ever known in nature. Um, and what's um, it's intriguing is that this, this enzyme has no activity whatsoever towards guanine acceptors. So it's highly, highly specific for synthesizing PPAPP. So at this point, we decided to give 1140 a name. And so we renamed it um, TAS1 for type six secretion PPAPP synthetase one. And it's able to catalyze three reactions I just showed you on the left. And on the bottom here is a schematic of those three species, which I'll just collectively refer to as um, PPAPP throughout, throughout the rest of the talk. Okay, so in addition to making these nucleotides, one other very striking observation we made was the catalytic um, rate of PPAPP synthetase by um, a PPAPP production by, the, by this enzyme. And what we found is that it's able to catalyze um, the formation of 180,000 molecules per minute, which is more than an order of magnitude, order of magnitude faster than the high, uh, most active PPGPP synthetase is characterized to date. And so, this is sort of intriguing because, um, like I mentioned before, PPGPP synthetases aren't toxins, right? The idea is not to kill the cell, it's to, it's to slow the cell down and keep it um, in a dormant state so that, so that it can survive. In contrast, we, knew, we know that our toxin or our protein is an interbacterial toxin. And so perhaps this difference in enzymatic rate uh, could explain the difference between what constitutes a toxin and what constitutes a pro-survival um, enzyme. Okay, so to look at this in more detail, we, we needed to go in vivo and look at what the heck the formation of PPAPP was doing to bacterial cells. So how is this toxin actually killing cells? And so Sherry uh, generated this uh, inducible depletion system that's, um, um, that's widely used in, in, in Pseudomonas. Um, and here he appended a tag on the immunity protein, which we had at this point renamed TIS1 um, for type six PPAPP synthetase immunity. Uh, one. Um, and what this tag does is it allows you to induceably degrade the immunity protein, right? Because as you can imagine, it's where we have, there's enormous technical difficulty with trying to have active TAS1 in cells because it kills them. And so a way for us to controllably look at this is to induce the degradation of immunity. Okay, so this is done by a protein called SSPB that will then bring the immunity to the CLIPXP protease once we induce SSPB expression with IPTG. And this of course gives us active TAS1. And so when Sherry and Bowie Wan did this, what they immediately saw was um, gratifyingly the formation of PPAPP and PPPAPP in vivo, supporting our in vitro biochemical data. What they also saw was a massive reduction in the levels of ADP and ATP in cells. And so um, at this point we started to really come up with the idea that given how active this enzyme is and what we're seeing in cells, the, its mode of killing may simply be the fact that it's depleting um, two of the most essential nucleotides required for life, for all cellular life in ADP and ATP. Shown on the right here, simply control where, where the TIS1 immunity protein is present, and you can see over the same amount of time, um, um, nucleotide levels are, are uh, unchanged and you don't get formation of these novel nucleotides. Okay, so just to remind you that um, rel proteins make PPGPP, R proteins make PPAPP. And so we wanted to next understand, you know, in a pairwise manner, um, uh, what the consequences are of PPGPP versus PPAPP accumulation um, under a controlled setting. And so to do this, we used actually an E. coli inducible expression system where we could, where we could express uh, REL-A, the protein I introduced to you earlier, and TAS1, um, you know, sort of being expressed at approximately the same levels and look at the consequences of this on cell viability. And so when you do a growth curve, you can see that when you induce the expression of either REL-A or TAS1, you notice a comparable cessation of growth in both of these strains. But what's really interesting is when you look at viability, when you look at the REL-A strains over time, viability of E. coli is not actually going down, it's staying constant. Again, consistent with the role of PPGPP as a survival 
mechanism. In contrast, cells expressing TAS1 show a substantial drop in viability over time, consistent with its role as an interbacterial toxin. Uh, to confirm that what we saw at a cellu cellular level was consistent with what we're proposing um, at a molecular level, we also took extracts of these, um, of these cells and looked at their nucleotide content. And so on the left here, you'll see traces from the REL-A expressing strain. So if you look at ATP and GTP, you can see that PPGPP and PPPGPP are, are formed, um, but you don't get a complete abolition of ATP and GTP levels in cells. Uh, again, explaining why the, probably explaining why these cells don't die. In contrast, look, look what happens when you express TAS1. Same amount of time and you get complete um, um, abolishment of ADP, ATP and ADP in cells and you get the formation of the, um, of the novel adenosine nucleotides. And so we think this experiment really nicely explained the differences between PPAPP toxicity and uh, PPGBP um, um, stasis. Okay, so at this point, we were quite convinced that the principal um, uh, consequence of TAS1 intoxication that leads to cell death is the, is the sudden depletion of ADP and ATP from cells. But of course, given that PPGBP is a signaling molecule that interacts with a number of proteins of bacteria, we wanted to remain somewhat agnostic um, to the idea that this could also be happening. Um, and of course, death can, can of course be multifactorial. And so a lot of the things that we have found could be happening simultaneously. And of course, it's quite challenging to figure out the exact molecular event that's, that's ultimately leading to death. Um, but we wanted to look um, to see if it, there was more than simply ADP and ATP depletion. And so to do this, we conducted metabolomics um, and looked at a lot of different um, central metabolites in bacterial cells. And what you're looking for here is the dark blue boxes. And so while, out of all the different pathways that we examined, something that really stood out to us was purine metabolism. And why this, one of the reasons this really struck, um, stuck out to us was based on um, actually work that Bo Yuan had, had published uh, just six months earlier. And so in a really nice paper uh, that he had published the year before, um, Bo Yuan had found that um, the, ends, the, the committed step of de novo purine biosynthesis, pure F, is in fact a novel PPGPP target. And here we are looking at PPABP intoxicated cells, and we're noticing substantial depletion in purine biosynthesis intermediates. And so this naturally led to the hypothesis that perhaps pure F is also a PPABP target, given the structural similarity between these nucleotides. And so to start to look at this, we first did ITC, which is an in, which is an in vitro experiment that looks at the uh, basically the um, the delta H of binding between a protein and a, and a ligand. And so we can see here is that both PPP, APP, and PPAPP uh, bind to pure F in the mid to low micromolar range, um, which given our prior experiments where we saw that PPAPP was accumulating to millimolar levels, uh, suggests that, that pure F would indeed be bound by PPAPP um, uh, in the cell at the concentrations we're observing. And so it seems that it can be bound to it. Uh, we were next able to co-crystallize pure F with PPAPP. Um, pure F forms a tetramer, um, and we were able to um, see PPAPP bound at, um, at two of the dimer-dimer interfaces. Now, this is interesting, but what really matters is whether PPAPP binding affects pure F function. Um, and that is, a, and, and then the function of this enzyme is basically, if you look at the diagram at the top, um, it's to basically add that first amine group as, as, this, as the pathway starts to build out the purine ring, right? So it's that first step there. Um, and that's just a close-up of the binding site. But indeed, what we found is that though not quite as potent as PPGPP, at levels, again, that are relevant to the concentrations we were seeing in cells, PPAPP was indeed able to inhibit uh, pure F. Uh, importantly, a uh, previously validated point mutation that abol abolishes PPGPP binding also abolished PPAPP binding and um, abrogated the ability of this nucleotide to influence the catalytic activity of this enzyme. <clears throat> so, sort of um, impressed upon you a lot of data there, but really comes down to a somewhat straightforward model. So what we think is happening is that 
when incompatible strains of Pseudomonas aeruginosa encounter each other um, in nature, um, you know, if they don't have immunity to TAS1, it'll be delivered into target cells by the type 6 secretion system. Uh, bacteria, like all cellular life, require ATP uh, for viability. And when TAS1 gets in there, it very, very rapidly converts this ATP into PPP, APP. Now, in data I didn't show you, um, what's kind of cool is that for bacteria that make PPGPP, there's an enzyme called SPO-T that's actually able to recycle GDP from PPGPP so that the process is reversible. We found that SPO-T is actually unable to hydrolyze PPAPP, suggesting that this conversion here um, could be irreversible in a cell. What this does is this rapidly um, and substantially reduces ATP levels in cells. That's bad. Uh, but also, through its formation, PPAPP is also able to interact with the committed step of de novo purine biosynthesis, uh, namely the enzyme PureF. And in doing so, um, it, it results in the prevention of the conversion of um, uh, PRPP to 5 um, phosphoribosyl amine, the first intermediate. Um, and of course, de novo purine biosynthesis is one of the critical steps that leads to the formation of, um, of new ATP. And so we think really TAS1 represents sort of a double-edged sword where it not only depletes existing ATP through the formation of PPAPP, but the product of the reaction itself is also able to inhibit the um, de novo uh, production of new purine nucleotides um, such as ATP, which the cell would presumably try to do as, it be, as its ATP levels are being depleted. Okay, so hopefully I didn't go over time there, but with that, I'd just like to make a few acknowledgements here. So I'd um, really like to acknowledge the members of my lab. Um, I have three graduate students at the moment, um, Tim, Sherry, and Nathan, all of, who are, are, all of whom are doing um, absolutely fantastic work with their projects and I'm very proud of them. Uh, currently, their work is being supported by um, two undergraduates, Sarah Trileski and Dirk Grabenk, uh, who have also been very, very helpful. Um, for the work I showed you today, I'd like to acknowledge again Mike Laub um, uh, and his postdoc Bo Yuan Wang and their staff scientist Robert Grant. Um, here at McMaster, we had help from Andrew and Rachel. And um, I should also point out that at the University of Calgary and the University of Toronto, um, we're very grateful to Peter Stogios and Alexei Savchenko for assistance with data collection. Um, I'd also um, like to thank other labs that we're working with because I think this um, uh, this award is a sort of a, um, a recognition of the summation of the work that the lab has done to date. And so I'd just like to thank um, Stefan Ronser and his postdoc Dennis Quentin at the Max Planck Institute in Dortmund, uh, Gerd Prenya and Kartik Sakar in, at the University of Manitoba, Gert Bange and Wieland Steinchen at Phillips University Marburg, and last but not least, our tri council agencies, uh, NSERC and CAHR. Uh, and so with that, I'd be more than happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you.